Hello everybody, today for the first International Nash Day we'll be talking about the risk factors linked to the disease. We'll have with us Dr. Schattenberg from the University of Mainz in Germany. Regarding the risk factors, the disease typically affects people with type 2 diabetes, obesity and metabolic syndrome. So one of our crews asked Professor Cousy, a prominent diabetologist, about the specific risk for this population. We also followed a group of medical students who were running a marathon in the south of France for the first International NASH Day. And finally, because NASH entails changing one's diet and to prove healthy food can be tasty, we challenged a famous chef to prepare the healthiest hamburger ever. So to address the topic of risk factors, there are two obvious questions that we're going to answer. Number one, are there some populations more at risk than others? Number two, what are the behavior that can further increase the risk of developing NASH? Dr. Schattenberg, hello. Hello. You're a gastroenterologist and an hepatologist. You work at the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Mainz in Germany. You've co-written a textbook for doctors on the approach to have regarding this disease by highlighting risk factors. Why did you write a textbook geared towards the medical world? Well, I think it's important to educate both doctors and patients about this disease. Non-alcoholic steatohepatitis is a silent disease and it does not cause a lot of symptoms. Doctors are just starting to realize that this can result in severe liver disease and that it's a severe cause of uh, impairment in health in, in their patients. So I think it's important to raise the awareness. So one of the main risk factors to develop NASH is lifestyle. Uh, it's important to assess uh, the habits of your patient, um, both the type of diet uh, and the intensity of the diet or the amount of calories, but also the composition macronutrients can be important. As far as fat's concerned, I mean, are men and women have the same kind of fat you know, around their belly, or are there some differences that lead to NASH? Yeah, so there are clearly differences in terms of the distribution of fat. So men traditionally have more adipose tissue, uh, which gives you a belly uh, around apple-shaped form. And women traditionally have a distribution of fat that sits more on the hips, and it makes them, you know, more pear-shaped. And I think that's a very important difference because the fat in your belly, the visceral fat, actually acts different. It's hormonally active compared to the one that's on your hips. Which would lead me to actually think that men are more at risk than women? That's true. Just because of that? That's one important factor. Are there others? There are others. Hormones could uh, play a role. We know that women uh, after menopause, for example, are more susceptible uh, to develop NASH. And men? Men, age is a risk factor in general, so increasing age is something that adds to uh, your risk. Okay, the other great risk factors for NASH is, as you said, type 2 diabetes. The figure speaks for themselves. 70% of type 2 diabetics have NAFLD and are therefore at risk for NASH. We asked Professor Cousy, diabetologist at the University of Florida, how we can link type 2 diabetes and NASH. Here is his viewpoint. As an endocrinologist, I have studied many patients with type 2 diabetes and NASH, and I can say that 7 out of 10 patients with type 2 diabetes have a fatty liver and about half of them have NASH. I think clearly there's a link between NASH, obesity, and type 2 diabetes. These three go hand in hand. We think that when adipose tissue and obesity is insulin resistance, it releases a kind of fat called fatty acids that are harmful to the liver and trigger pathways of inflammation and eventually fibrosis and cirrhosis. So which is the egg or the chicken is very unclear um, because when we study the patients, they have obesity on one hand and already NASH. However, we think that clearly uh, because reversing obesity helps the liver, it is really the obesity factors that are hurting the liver and that's where our interventions are gonna be aimed at. Professor Bujanizi has joined us. Hello, Professor. Hi. Uh, you're a gastroenterologist at the University of Torino in Italy, and you specialize in NASH. You're used to patients affected by NASH. Are they all type 2 diabetics? I can say that in my clinic, approximately one-third of our patients are, are, have type 2 diabetes. Uh, but I would say that many of them have pre-diabetes, that we can diagnose uh, with uh, an oral glucose tolerance test. Some of them are just overweight. 
Regarding the risk factors, when we talk about NASH, are there other main risk factors beyond type 2 diabetics or obesity, age, gender, ethnic groups, ethnic backgrounds? Do they count? Absolutely, I think they count. Uh, age is, uh, is a risk factor that has been identified in a lot of the epidemiological studies uh, and the genetic background also uh, related to certain um, mutations, so a genetic, uh, single genetic mutation that can add to your risk to develop more advanced NASH. Um, Professor this is, this is true especially for the Mexican population and Mexican-American population. They have a lot of genetic mutation that can add on lifestyle. How do you explain that? We now live in an obesogenic environment and that was not meant to be for the way that we have been built because our ancestors were hunter. They didn't eat all the day. They uh, were able to eat like once a week or twice a week. So uh, those uh, who were uh, uh, more able to survive were those uh, who were more able to accumulate fat because fat uh, is the reservoir of energy. And if you are able to accumulate fat, then you have energy to survive through the, the fasting state. While nowadays uh, we have plenty of food, a disadvantage of our evolution has turned into a disadvantage because still we we'll have the, the, the ability to accumulate fat. Insulin resistance, in fact, is uh, a condition that uh, helps to accumulate energy as fat and can be favorable if you live in the desert. And from a pure societal standpoint, from a pure social standpoint, are we all equally at risk regarding the disease or are there social inequality that lie beneath when it comes to NASH? So the type of diet and uh, the composition of the diet is important. And I think that if you are able to spend more money on your diet, you might be able to pick out more unprocessed food, more uh, organic foods, for example, that do have less added sugar. Uh, fructose was mentioned. So I think, you know, if you have to um, really lie on uh, f processed foods, uh, that's a risk factor. Poor people from rich countries have uh, uh, more access to uh, low-cost junk food and they are less educated to understand uh, uh, what's the problem with this kind of food. While rich people in poor country it's the reverse, it's like a social factor because uh, uh, obesity means wellness in some way. So good work and exercise are definitely useful to reduce risk factors. We followed a group of medical students in the south of France who are running long distances to increase awareness about NASH. For the first International NASH Day, they will run 42 kilometers, a marathon. Today in Montauban, France, members of a recently formed association united against NASH, backed by the NASH Education Program, are on the starting line, ready to run a 44-kilometer marathon relay race to promote awareness about this disease. You are going to place on your point of rolling, to get warm. Don't forget to talk about you and why you are here. The 12th of June is the first day of the National Day of NASH. We need to make it known. We need to fight together against the NASH. Are you ready? The runners are on the starting line, and the marathon begins. Maxime and Nicola have left their running shoes in the locker room because they're here to inform the public. We have a stand with Maxime to accueillir the public leur remettre des plaquettes informatives, les informer de la première journée internationale de la NASH qui aura lieu le 12 juin. L'association a principalement pour but donc, de faire découvrir la NASH qui est une maladie méconnue, d'expliquer au grand public les symptômes, pourquoi la maladie s'installe, d'aider les patients qui sont atteints. On est aux portes d'une épidémie mondiale, c'est un problème de santé publique majeur, donc il est urgent de tirer la sonnette d'alarme. C'était la première fois que je faisais 11 km, mais c'est pour l'association. The team keeps up its momentum from one relay point to the next. Meanwhile, Maxime and Nicolas continue their own awareness marathon. Bonjour, messieurs. Bonjour. Est-ce que vous connaissez la NASH Non. Est-ce que vous connaissez ce t-shirt 
Pas du tout. La nage, c'est une grave maladie du foie qui évolue euh, silencieusement, sans symptômes. Pour euh, vraiment être réactif et se mettre à, à l'activité physique et au changement surtout d'alimentation, éviter le sucre, et, euh, etc. Voilà. Non, c'est pas évident. 4 millions de Français seraient atteints. Certains ne le savent pas. J'espère qu'il n'y a pas beaucoup de personnes de qui nous dans mon entourage. After three hours of relaying, one by one, the association team members cross the finish line. For Maxime and Nicholas, it's also mission accomplished. A first step for this association, which will continue to relay information. To Schattenberg, the exercising is one thing, but how critical is it uh, to have uh, to adopt a good diet in order to reduce your risk factors. So if you actually decrease your weight uh, and decrease your adipose tissue, uh, then the uh, factors that contribute to liver inflammation are going down. So that's beneficial for your, uh, for your liver. Also, likely your insulin sensitivity, you're more sensitive to this important hormone, uh, goes up. So uh, this helps again. So less fat decreases inflammation within my liver. Absolutely. So eating well does not necessarily mean avoiding the food that we enjoy most. We have decided for this first International Nash Day to challenge a young chef, Stephen Raman. We asked him to cook a hamburger, but remember, it should be healthy, easy to prepare, and delicious. Alors aujourd'hui, je vais vous prouver qu'on peut cuisiner bon, assez rapidement et très sain. Et étonnamment, on va travailler sur un hamburger pour vous prouver que c'est possible. On a besoin donc d'un pain qui a été élaboré avec mon boulanger. On a besoin de volaille. Là, on va prendre du suprême de volaille pour garder vraiment du moelleux dans notre hamburger. On a un peu de pané, du chou blanc, de l'ail des ours, de la salade sucrine pour amener du croquant, de l'asperge verte, un peu d'échalote et un peu d'oignon rouge. After grinding the chicken with the garlic and shallots, form a patty with the mix and steam it. Donc là, notre volaille a cuit 10 minutes. On peut la sortir. Ensuite, on va passer aux asperges. On va faire revenir ça sans matière grasse. Là, je vais mouiller mes asperges avec le lait pour pouvoir réaliser le, le crémeux d'asperges. After cooking the asparagus for 30 minutes, transfer them to a blender. Et on obtient un crémeux d'asperges et qui va pouvoir facilement venir se mettre sur notre pain et vraiment garder de la texture. Cook the onions in equal measures of water and vinegar. On met le vinaigre à la fin, parce que si on le met au début, le vinaigre va s'évaporer et du coup, on n'aura plus cette acidité. Simmer the red onions for 15 minutes and let them cool in their own juice. Then prepare the other vegetables, lettuce, asparagus, parsnips and white cabbage. Cook the chicken patty one last time in a neutral vegetable oil, like grapeseed oil, accompanied by the white cabbage. On va pouvoir le sortir de la poêle. Là, on n'a plus qu'à monter le burger. Et voilà, un bon burger très sain pour la santé, sans trop de matière grasse, voire quasiment pas du tout. Bonne dégustation. Is it something that you would recommend to patients that come to your clinic? Well, actually, that sounds good and also healthy because uh, he was able to eliminate the fat component of the burger. But we should also uh, be careful with the bread because the industrial bread has a lot of fructose inside. It is sweet, and it shouldn't be. So, as you may know, it's possible to post questions on our website. We've received one on risk factors. Uh, Professor Bugianesi, this one comes from Megan, and her question is, are there any genetic predisposition linked to NASH? Yes, there is, and we are working hard to find out all the genetic traits that can be changed in people with NASH, but um, on a general basis you can find uh, families where many people are affected by the same disease, and the same is for NASH. I've got another question, and this is for you, Professor Schettenberg. Uh, we often hear about metabolic syndromes. What is exactly metabolic syndromes, and how is it a risk factor for NASH? So important, it's not one disease or one risk factor. Metabolic syndrome defines patients that accumulate risk factors, namely 
being obese, suffering from diabetes, high blood pressure. So all these are independent risk factors for NASH. And if they come together in a single individual, it's commonly referred to as metabolic syndrome because they have an even higher risk to develop more advanced disease. Okay. Well, that's the end of this program on risk factors. Uh, thank you for joining us, Professor Bergenesi and Professor Schattenberg. Thank you. For and us. thank you all. Of course, you can always actually have more information if you go onto our website and watch our program.